Good day and welcome to this episode of Technology Enhanced Learning, the show that features brief summaries about research and innovation in the areas of computer-based instruction. I am your host, Vedith Rodrigo, from the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. In today's episode, we are speaking with Professor Gautam Biswas. Professor Biswas is a Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Engineering and Professor of Computer Science, Computer Engineering, and Engineering Management in the EECS Department of Vanderbilt University. One of his areas of specialization is in developing intelligent, open-ended learning environments focused on learning and instruction in STEM domains. He has also developed innovative learning analytics and data mining techniques for studying students' learning behaviors and linking them to their metacognitive and self-regulated learning strategies. Gautam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, David, and I really appreciate the introductions. We are focusing this interview on your current work on developing collaborative computational STEM learning environments, something you call C2 STEM. Um, could you start off by telling us a little about what C2 STEM is? Yeah, so uh, as you pointed out, David, we, uh, we have been working for a while in developing environments uh, to help students learn science. And the way we do that is by getting them to construct models of scientific processes. So our original work on Betty's brain was getting students to build a causal model of a scientific process. And of course, we couched it in the form where the, the students were teaching an agent. Uh, so and that was very engaging for them and they really liked working on that system. So here we have decided to uh, open it up and bring in science and computation because there's a close relationship between the two. So uh, what we do is we get students to build computational models of scientific processes. So computational models in science are typically simulations. Now students are not expert in computing. So we have created a block structured language that they use to create their uh, science models. We have changed the blocks. They, they don't represent, uh, they do have the typical computing constructs like conditionals, loops, uh, uh, you know, naming of variables, etc. But in this case, for example, when they name variables, these variables are related to the science domain construct that they're working in. So when they're dragging and dropping these blocks, they think they're creating scientific models. The advantage of a system like uh, C2STEM, which is, uh, you know, collaborative computational STEM learning environment, is that as students build their models, they can simulate their models. So they can actually see the behaviors of their models. And that gives them uh, feedback on how well and how correctly they are building their models. And so they go through this process of building, simulating, testing, and, and uh, gradually get to the correct model. And why do you think it's important for our students to, to learn computational thinking? I mean, this, this process that you describe of building, testing, and then refining the model again, uh, that is sort of the computational thinking process, correct? But why, why do you think it is important? So if you, if you look at computational thinking in general, it's very much related to this concept of critical thinking that we think is very important in education. Uh, the word computational comes in because uh, all of the thinking that you're doing, uh, and this involves you know, thinking about a, a problem, how to represent that problem so that you can solve it, coming up with the solution, but then also making sure you verify the solution and you've got it correct. So, so it's really a, a problem solving process. The word computational comes in because computers have become so prevalent nowadays that most people, when they, when they solve problems, they're actually using some form of computation. They're, they're using a computer to solve the problem. So, so that, that's why the notion of computational thinking is very important. It's looking at the whole problem solving process, but doing it in a computational form. In one of your papers, uh, you discuss a framework for integrating science, engineering, and computational thinking. Um, I'm sorry, computational modeling. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us a little about this framework? 
Yeah, so the idea is, you know, uh, we, we claim we are working in STEM learning environments, right? And STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So you can get students to build models, and that's fine. You know, they're often excited because they're building models of phenomena that they are familiar with. But why do people build models, right? People build models, of course, sometimes to understand a phenomena, sometimes to explain it to others. But very often, right, we are building these models to solve problems. And that's where the connection between science and engineering comes in. So, so we've decided that, you know, why not get the students to apply the models they build to solving problems? And naturally, when you're thinking of solving problems, engineering problems come to mind. You know, students love designing things. So, so therefore, the connection is, uh, is very appropriate. And we've been very successful in getting students to, you know, learn, learn their science, apply it to an engineering problem, and do this all in a computational framework. And how do you apply this framework to designing curricular activities? Yeah, so the one that we have uh, done quite a bit of work in is an earth sciences curriculum. So, you know, on the east coast of the United States, we get quite a lot of rain. Uh, in, in lots of, uh, not as much on the West Coast, but uh, so kids, uh, you know, they have, they go to school, they have playgrounds in school, but when there's heavy rainfall, either the playground floods or, you know, you get this runoff from different areas. And, and so kids are quite familiar with the phenomena. They, they also don't like the fact that the playgrounds get flooded, and, uh, which means that for a few days they can't go out and, and do any activities. So we decided to sort of exploit that. And the idea was, you know, why not uh, teach them about runoff? And then runoff is related to, say, when you get heavy rainfall, depending on the materials, right, that the rain falls on, uh, some of, most of the water gets absorbed and the rest that cannot get absorbed becomes a runoff. Uh, so, so the idea was to get students to understand these concepts. Of course, we are working with low middle school students, so we are not getting them to build sophisticated mathematical models, but to study the relationships. So, so what exactly is runoff? And, you know, we give them, they start with uh, conceptual modeling. So, you know, they have a school playground, they have rain falling, and then they have to think about if this much rain for, uh, fell, and this much could get absorbed, what would happen to the rest? And so that becomes runoff or flooding. And, and so we started from that concept, then got them to think about different materials. What if it fell on concrete versus if it fell on grass, right? Would the amount that get absorbed be the same? So we give them a set of materials and they work with that. They learn that different materials have different absorption rates and therefore you get different amounts of uh, absorption and runoff. So they build that into a computational model, so, uh, which is a very simple model. It says if you, know, this, you have this much rainfall and your material can absorb this much, what is the remaining amount? So if the material can absorb all of the rain, then you get no runoff. And, and if, it, if it cannot, then, then the difference becomes a runoff. So that's the computational model. And then, then, of course, we presented it to them early on. The engineering problem they have to solve is they have to redesign their playground, right, to minimize the amount of runoff or flooding on the playground. And, of course, when you do an engineering design, you have to meet certain constraints. One of them is costs, right? So you, they, are, they have the choice of using different materials, but certain materials are more costly than others. So they have to choose the set of materials that will meet their cost constraints. And of course, a playground has multiple functionalities, right? They might want a soccer field, which you call football everywhere else in the world. Uh, they might want a basketball court. They might want a play area with a, with a gym. So uh, different materials have to be used in different areas. So that's, uh, so we give them uh, a layout that they have to uh, you know, design for the playground. And a third constraint we put is it has to be accessible. You know, there are certain students uh, who are maybe somewhat handicapped and cannot move around everywhere. So can you create areas where you know, they can go to and also enjoy the playground? So students work with these constraints. And uh, uh, so after they build the computational model, that computational model is, tra tra you know, is transferred into the engineering design domain 
where they are choosing different materials for their playground. They get to see how much a particular design costs, right? How much runoff there is. And so they have to go through the, this process of trying to look, look at different materials and come up to minimum, you know, to ones that they consider are good solutions. So it's very interesting. We, we, this is our three week curriculum. We run in fifth and sixth grade classrooms. At the end of it, students get together, you know, in small groups, they compare their designs and they decide which is the best. And then they, that group presents their design to the rest of the class. So students enjoy that a lot. It sounds like uh, this is the sort of activity that can be, that, that you can use with a class that is not necessarily computer based. So if you had a school that was under resourced, like a school that didn't have computers, it still sounds like something that, uh, it, it sounds like an activity that you could actually, that you could still use. Um, could you Could you say something about how we can teach computational thinking in contexts that are under-resourced? Yeah, you could do it in paper and pencil. There have been, uh, you know, a lot of work. I know Chiket Loy has, has come up with this idea of unplugged activities to learn computational thinking. So we, we also have those in order to help students learn about conditionals, etc. In between, we intersperse them with activities that helps their learning. So, for example, in, in our case, they play a dice game. They roll dice and then based on, you know, so they've rolled two dice based on what the face values are, they have to make a decision. Let's say it's two players playing, right, depending on the roll of the dice, uh, each one rolls and then whoever has a higher score wins. So, so you can see some of these you can you can do with paper and pencil with with other materials, uh, and and s similarly our our whole curriculum it can be done in paper and pencil. What what you would lose in that case is either the teacher would have to be you know evaluating as students build and when they have difficulties how how to address those difficulties because students do have difficulties. These are not trivial tasks that we have given them. It could be done on pencil and paper. It would be, you know, the same sequence with, with a lot more intervention for, from the teacher as students, students are working on paper and pencil, which might make it a little more difficult for the teacher. An another uh, alternative that I thought of, did it when you asked the question, is sometimes, you know, each student in the class may not have a, a computer, computer to work on it mm -hmm. on, on, on the problems by themselves. If you have a smaller number of computers, you could put students into groups and they could work together. But uh, even in the worst case, let's say you have one computer in the class, the teacher can walk through them, walk them through this uh, problem solving process by actually doing it in front of the class, but getting as much input as he can from the students. So it doesn't become, it become changes from individualized learning to group learning to classroom learning but it can be done. All right, thank you. Uh, so we've come to the end of the interview actually, and this is where I would, I normally ask our, our guests uh, for the final thoughts. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with those who are listening to this video? Um, maybe something about the value of computational thinking or any kinds of call to action? Yeah, I, I would, uh, re firstly, I would like to thank you all for uh, inviting me and, you know, asking these very interesting questions. Uh, I've enjoyed trying to answer them. Uh, what I would like to say is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very important for us to change the way we do instruction in school. And it's not just, say, in one country or the other. In most countries in the world, instruction is is sort of still looked upon as the teacher or the instructor sort of uh, you know lecturing the students and hoping the students would learn maybe now you do give them some exercises and grade them but uh you know i i think it's very important for us to think about as as you know new technologies and resources become available that uh, we try to make the learning process more active Right. We, we, we give the students more agency. So, you know, you present a problem, you give them some ideas and then let them have a chance to try to figure out how to solve a problem, whether it is building a model or, you know, 
having uh, learned some topic, how to solve problems in that particular area. And, and uh, that kind of interaction, I think, is very important. Another small point I'd like to make as we end up is we've been working with technology in schools for a long time, and our teachers love that. But what we have realized is uh, one very interesting thing we found out is at some point our teachers told us, you know, you, you build these systems and you take, get them into class and, and, you know, students work on these systems in, uh, on, uh, on problems and areas that we have taught, which is very good, right? Because students are excited, they lo love working on these systems. But one thing is when students are working on a computer system, it becomes a complete black box for the teacher. You know, they don't know what students are doing for that half hour or 45 minutes that the students are working on the system. And that disturbs the teachers a lot. They want to keep track of what students are doing, not because they want to do it for disciplinary purposes, but they're really interested in seeing how students are thinking and solving the problems. Of course, one side is that, you know, students may have difficulties and, you know, your systems can help students some, but you know, humans are much better eventually at, at helping others learn. And on the other side, right, uh, when students do something uh, innovative and somewhat different from, say, the routine, the teacher should go praise them and encourage them to continue thinking along those lines. Or maybe take that idea and, and, and sort of make the rest of the class aware of it. And our teachers really like doing that. So, one of the things we are doing to further enhance the use of technology in the classroom is, is to work more closely with the teachers and eventually come up with these dashboards. Because as you said, if we do a lot of learning analytics, that learning analytics is mostly to publish papers. It's not being used to go tell the teachers that this is how you know, your students are doing and this is how you may want to improve. Or, or you may, uh, you know, want to change your instruction to help the students more. So we are trying to do that. We, we are working closely with the teachers. We are seeing what kind of analytics they really want to see, right? And then trying to put those into dashboards. Currently, we do it purely as a reflection activity, unlike some other people who worked on orchestration and dashboards in the classroom. We do it as... Uh, something the teachers can reflect on at the end of the day before they prepare for the next class. And we found that that, that to be quite effective and that's an area of research that we are pursuing a lot now. Sorry if I went too long, but uh, I just wanted to make that point of bringing no, no. teachers more into the technology group. Great, thank you. Thank you for all that. Well, what you said about um, we, we do analytics to publish papers. I feel so good that you said that because that's sometimes how I feel as well. <laughs> that uh, that the, the research, it's so important for the work that we do to, to end up in the classrooms and yet so much of our energy is focused on analysis that a classroom teacher may yeah. never really see. But anyway, we, but yes, I'm, I'm glad that you're, that you're actually addressing that. Um, the other, the other thought that I had, I just didn't want to cut you off because, uh, you know, it's it's important for the recording to be clean. Um, the, this reminds me so much. The approach reminds me so much of of the Jasper Woodbury series, which I yeah. think was from Vanderbilt many many years ago. Not yeah, before. it was, and I was part. That's how I got into oh, this there. area. So John oh. Bransford, Van Schwartz. Yes, there was a That's group great. at. The, they started yeah, this work at Peabody, in, and I was in yes. computer science, but uh, that's right, how I got right. into this area. They wanted to build computer environments that went along with the Jasper system. And, uh, right, and you know, the um, I'm so that's so amazing because I was introduced to the Jasper Woodbury series. My gosh, I don't know, must have been twenty years ago, and um, I, and I went so far as to buy the this the, the they were yeah. laser discs yeah, that were like yeah, long playing yeah, records, yeah. right? We and so we have them in Ateneo, and I and I would I would demonstrate them to my classes, uh -huh. um, just just to show them that okay, there's this approach that's being right. uh, investigated yeah. in, in Vanderbilt, and uh, and you know at at some point the equipment became out of date, 
So uh-huh. we had to, I had to ask one of our technicians to transfer them one to CD. <laughs> yeah. And then that became out of date. So I don't know. So, so I, I'm pretty sure we still have them in the department, in my department. Somewhere. But mm-hmm. oh, that's so amazing. I was, I was a big fan. I was a big fan of the series. And we had several episodes, uh, yeah. which, which I showed to my students. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your for your time and for, for sharing your research with us. I'm really, really grateful to you that, that, uh, that we had this interview. And um, I and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I should thank you too. So it was a very interesting conversation. Great questions from you, David. Thank you, Jen and Nathan, for helping uh, put this together.